Fun time. Welcome to the podcast, another edition of IOS. It's only sport, Martin Devlin, Lachlan War. We have a live radio show that's not on the radio, it's only online. You've got to download the Platform New Zealand app and you can listen to us every afternoon. If you can't do that, well, we condense it all into this 45 minutes highlights worth. So we try and sort of pack as much sports news as we can possible so that if you're sitting there after the end of a hard day and thinking, okay, what went on in the world of sport today? Well, here we go. On the show, Mark Levy, continuous call team, the CCC from 2GB. They are just brilliant on the radio. Mark talking everything to do with league. Who's going to win the Premier League title? Arsenal, Man City, Liverpool. For the first time ever in the history of the Premier League, 92-93 it started. This is the closest title race ever. Never before have three teams with 10 games to go been within such a hair's breadth of each other. Just a point separating those three teams' goal difference. Arsenal are on top. We talked cricket today as well. What are the Black Caps going to look like in a year from now? Who's going to be the captain? Who's going to be the coach? Are those two still going to be there? Who's going to lead the bowling attack? All of that kind of stuff. And World Rugby are talking about discussing the idea of having a meeting where they will debate the possibility of scheduling yet another meeting to look at whether or not they will consider implementing the 20-minute red card rule. We start the show the same way every day. Tablets in hand, gather my flock. It is time for a sermon. Just adopt the 20-minute rule, you dumb sods. Let's go to the mountaintop. We live in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots. World Rugby is at a crossroads around the 20-minute red card rule. At the recent Shape of the Game Summit in Dublin, this was the one big change recommended by officials down this part of the world, that they want to get past officials all around the world. To introduce into the international game what has already been trialled and accepted into Super Rugby since 2020 and the Rugby Championship since 2021. What it would mean is that a player who cops a red card returns back onto the field after 20 minutes, ensuring a 15-on-15 contest remains but in turn then might cop a stiffer penalty when they face the judiciary after the game. Now, from what I've read in accompanying articles, the Six Nations countries are opposed and it needs a 75% vote to get past the gatekeeper. Even if it did this at the vote in May, they would then want to themselves trial it for however long, we don't know. So it may or may not get to become law in the international game by the time the next Rugby World Cup rolls around. But that would probably be the earliest. Come on. Uh, this is a no-brainer, isn't it? This is where world rugby continuously and constantly let themselves and the game down, shoot themselves in both feet. They drag the chain. Their administrative processes are just impossibly convoluted. The pace of change is like watching one continuous, laborious reset scrum. Let's make it easy for the fish heads. Fans want entertainment. Fans are the game. 14 versus 15 destroys every game of rugby. Instances and accidents happen on the field. We know that. They happen in split seconds. If the action is not violent, malicious or deliberate, then the red card should be 20 minutes and then you get back on the field. Any suggestion of foul play or persistent, deliberate, professional fouling, you get sent off for the whole game. It's not that bloody hard, is it? It really isn't. Listen to your customers. They are your sport. Make the decision. Make it now. But no, more deliberations, more meetings, more discussions, because that's how a fat cat administration does these things. The longer it takes, the more snout in the trough, more money they all make. Because they all get paid to go to these meetings. They get their five-star hotels, they clip the ticket on the air points, all of that kind of stuff. It's the turkey Christmas thing. Why would they vote for something? That means they don't have to go back then and rediscuss it and maybe vote for it again later on. It's just insane. It is ridiculous. But this is world rugby. There is a commonality about everything to do with the sport and the way that it is run at an international level. They drag the chain. The whole palaver, kerfuffle around this 20-minute red card rule is just a perfect example of what is absolutely and continually suffocating this great game. Devlin. What do you want? We want information 
Information. You won't get it. The platform. Headlines rock before we go to Mark Levin. I'm really looking forward to this. Yep. I am too. I'll start off with uh, some NRL news. I don't know if it's a, if news or it's just some sort of nice little stories hanging around. But uh, Sean Johnson has revealed that his return to the New Zealand Warriors ahead of 2022 was almost a non-move and he could have indeed signed with the Canterbury Bulldogs. He's spoken with Fox Sports Australia. He was never signing with the Canterbury Bulldogs. Good God. Well, according, really? according to his... End your career in ignominy. Well, Come on, Sean. I'm not buying that, According mate. to I'm his chat not, with Fox Sports Australia, he mate. came close to joining the Bulldogs in what, That would have been a desperate move. That, that, come on, man. I remember when Johnson was off contract with the Sharks, didn't even table... I'm pretty sure didn't even table him an offer and no one else really wanted Bro, let's be thankful that you're back playing your best yeah. league with and us. And he's back at his best. Fair played on. Brilliant season last year. Uh, Netball New Zealand is investigating a potential bid to host the 2031 World Cup. I like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, NNZ bid to host last year's World Cup, but were pipped by Cape Town, with World Netball opting to have the sports pinnacle event in Africa for the first time. Uh, New Zealand football has confirmed the All Whites will meet Mexico in September, continuing to seek games against top 50 teams in the build-up to the 2026 FIFA World Cup. Now, that's the first one with 48 teams, right? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. The Next run will be a double that, and by 2042, there's going to be 900 teams involved. Mm. They're All scouring the, the galaxy at the moment. Playing, yeah. <laughs> playing games on Mars. Uh, Champions League this morning, Arsenal <laughs> advancing. They finished 1-0 winners over Porto in the second league, but 1-1 on aggregate, which meant they went to extra time. Went to penalties after that, after there were no goals in extra time. And then 4-2 Arsenal were the victors. They didn't miss a penalty. And uh, two of Porto's were saved, so they advance to the round. Uh, sorry, to the quarterfinals for the first time since. Oh, I'd say it'd be fourteen years, fifteen years, two thousand years, two thousand and ten. They uh, went something like six straight years losing in the round of sixteen after yeah, that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, so name all six teams that have qualified so far. Well, Arsenal, mm-hmm. Barcelona, yes, Man City, yes, Inter. No, Inter play tomorrow. I've got the schedule here. Bayern Munich, yes. Don't tell me. It's four. I need two more. Tula to Tusha Papa Tu. Oh, PSG. Yes. Um, and I want to say one of the Sociedad that didn't get through, did No, they? the eternal winners. Porto. The eternal winners of the European Cup. Oh, Real Madrid, yeah, of there course. You go. Six winners. Excuse me. Yeah, right. uh, the other match this morning was Barcelona beating Napoli 3 1. I think it was 1 1 on aggregate before that it was indeed. So Barcelona advanced to the quarterfinals. Tomorrow it's Dortmund against PSV, 1-1 on aggregate in that one, and Atletico Madrid against Inter, Inter lead that tie 1-0, but that second match is on the road in Madrid. Uh, the husband of former Olympic cyclist Melissa Hoskins will face court after allegedly causing her death. His name is Rowan Dennis, he's a former world champion cyclist. Terrible story, this one. Yeah, he was arrested in January and charged with causing death by dangerous driving, mm. driving without due care and endangering life. Uh, former All Blacks first five, Tony Brown admits he hasn't given up hope of one day coaching the All Blacks. Uh, this is what he had to say when spoken to. When I got asked to coach the All Blacks five years ago, for me it just didn't feel right. I obviously had a really good relationship with Jamie Joseph and if he had got the All Blacks coaching job, then 100% I would have been in with him. Five. So when, for, for when Fozzie was appointed, well, Jamie Joseph, that's right, because they, they stretched the whole saga out that's right. and then Jamie Joseph yeah. just was re-signed right. to Japan. Well, you know, originally uh, Ian Foster wanted those two guys as his running mate. So why didn't that happen? Uh, because they, because Jamie signed with Japan because they fannied around so much. Mm. He, had, he had a contract on the table after the World Cup in 2019 where Japan five times his salary. And then what Brent Imby did, the chairman of New Zealand Rugby, is he wrote 32 letters. 37. Or, 37 around the same galaxy we're searching for teams to play the 900-team football World Cup looking for people to coach the All Blacks when there's about three on the planet that actually had the qualifications, if you remember. By the time that all happened, Jamie said, listen, I know I'm not going to be involved anyway. I'll sign for Japan. Which is why this time they appointed the All Black coach a year out from the World Cup and kicked Ian Foster to touch. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. That sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, some other rugby news. This is quite an interesting story. Uh, very modern, shall we say. Emmanuel Faye Waboso has been ruled out of England's final Six Nations game against France after the first-year medical student diagnosed and reported his own symptoms of concussion. How about that? That's actually... I, I quite like that. Uh, and finally, let's run through some NFL... What you mean? The scientific mouth guard didn't do it for him? Oh, what happened to that? Those have been binned, haven't they? Or they've been pulled back in terms of... Um, yeah, you think? 
Yeah. You think? Yeah. Well, yeah. no, because a story came out about it. They Not s- a whisper s- since, right? Since the first round when they cocked it up with the Chiefs. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, NFL free agency moves, some big ones over the last couple of days. I actually just realised I didn't talk about this in my bulletin yesterday, so I'll quickly run through the biggest news so far to do with this. Uh, four-time pro bowler Derek Henry was with the Tennessee. He signed with the Baltimore Ravens. Doesn't move the needle? Not really. Baltimore still need to somehow overcome that playoff hump, and I don't think a running back will solve, solve those problems. But it's a good sign. It's a very good signing. Other big moves today and yesterday. Kirk Cousins left the Vikings. He's now with the Atlanta Falcons. Baker Mayfield re-signed with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Russell Wilson going to the Pittsburgh Steelers. That was quite a good move. I like that one. Uh, Saquon Barkley with the Giants has signed with my Eagles. Josh Jacobs joining the Green Bay Packers from the Raiders. As I say, Derek Henry moving as well. Wide receivers, not a huge amount. Mike Evans, I think, did he re-sign? He's re-signed Tampa Bay. Yep, T. Higgins, franchise tagged by Cincinnati. Apart from that, Dalton Schultz re-signed with Houston as well. Nothing much apart from that. Some defensive players moved around. Shaq Barrett uh, left Tampa Bay. He's gone to Miami. Chris Jones is re-signed with Kansas City. Devlin. That is a disgusting act. The platform. CCC on 2GB, the continuous call team. These guys are just brilliant on radio. If if you can't get in front of a telly, this is the best way to follow the NRL over the weekend. David Morrow, lead caller, sadly been diagnosed with brain cancer. David's a great friend of the show, uh, so obviously we can't talk to him at the moment. Mark Levy took his place today for the first time appearing on iOS, it's only sport. He is just brilliant, along with the big man, uh, along with Gal, um, along with Soward. Yeah, it's excellent radio. It really is. It is of the highest quality. Mark Levy. Mark, before we even start anything, um, just uh, please um, give us, uh, you know, what you know of of, 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 of how David is. Because, uh, I mean, that news is absolutely devastating. Um, but uh, he's very helpful over a number of years and a, and, and a great friend of the show. Oh, he's in good spirits. Um, it's it's brain cancer, so it's it's not good. Um, we've all been rocked by it back here too. But um, he's in good spirits. He's receiving treatment, and I know one thing that he's desperate to do is go on another holiday with his uh, darling wife Christine. So I I hope to go and see him tomorrow. Actually, so I'll um, I'll pass on the regards of all of his wonderful fans over there in NZ, including you, Marty. Thank you so much, my friend. All right, continuous call team. It is absolutely brilliant radio. Uh, we used to have it here in New Zealand when I was working on Radio Sport. We switched it on the weekends, mate. It's just absolutely compelling. Vegas to start with, you're on that trip, man. I mean, so just give us a quick thoughts and impressions. Well, it was, my, it was my first time in the United States, my first time in Vegas, and as somebody who doesn't mind a punt and a drink, Go it's on. a very dangerous place for someone like me. But um, I, I thought... I thought the NRL did a wonderful job. It was um, everything worked well. I mean, there's going to be little teething problems that they'll address and, and sort out for the years to come. But um, I, I think a good barometer on, on the success of it was when you jumped into an Uber and the American driver says, "Oh, you're Australian. You're here for the rugby." So they, they knew about it. Yep. Um, a lot's been made about the sixty thousand people who watched on American television. I think that number's only going to grow. So Peter Volandis, he was my first boss when I was seventeen. Everything he touches turns to gold and um the, the thing i love about it is that we're trying new things we're trying to get a new audience we're trying to capitalize on the success of rugby league and um i regard it as the greatest game of all time so here's to a, a long fruitful future in the united states and a few more people watching in vegas as well yeah look and you know a part of it is the show the razzmatazz and there's no bigger place in the world to actually do that whether or not the sport gains a foothold like american sports i mean it probably won't but if you get a some kind of a toehold into the american gambling scene the sports betting well that's a cash cow and i think that's really where volandis might just be edging well, and that's the thing. We only need to secure 0.01% of the population and the gambling revenue. And we're talking about millions and millions of dollars that can be reinvested in the game into grassroots, potentially another team over there in New Zealand. I mean, the the the, the world is sort of our oyster at the moment. And, you know, a lot of people are critical of, of the NRL over a whole range of things, but good on them for trying something new. I mean, the AFL over here in Australia is talking about taking a game to Vegas now or to the United States. So... You know, we've become the, the pioneers and the trendsetters here. And a lot of people forget that if it wasn't for the forward thinking of Volandis and Abdo and all those at Rugby League Central at the NRL, we may not even be here talking about mm-hmm. Rugby League, thinking right. back to the pandemic because of the financial fragilities of the game. So I say good on them. Congratulations to them. I'm, I'm the first person to be critical of them 
over a whole range of things. But when it comes to Vegas and the States, I think they're on a winner. Yeah, when it comes to the top three, the top four teams, I mean, it, and it's, a, it's a very brave person who's going to argue that, it, you know, Penrith, Melbourne uh, and and, and uh, Brisbane won't be in it. Um, could you add the Roosters to that after what you saw after them shutting Brisbane down to just 10 points? Oh, definitely. And, you know, they've probably got one of the, the star-studded sides capable of going all the way this year. And I ran into Trent Robinson at the airport, and um, even he was... He was a bit hard on himself, actually, Trent, the coach of the Roosters. He said, you know, I've got to be better as a coach this year and everything else. And I thought to myself, you know, he's not the ones out there dropping the ball and throwing the forward passes and, you know, turning over possession. So, look, at the end of the day, the buck stops with the coach, I suppose. And everything he said to me really impressed me. So... Um, you know, with, with the star-studded side they've got with the Tedesco's, I love watching Victor Radley. I thought Joseph Swaliki played well in Vegas as well. Um, I think they're going to be another force to be reckoned with the Roosters, along with, you know, the, the Storm and the Panthers and everybody else. The balance between wanting to make it the most super-fast game as well as retaining the absolute brutality that league fans love, and I look back to that arm wrestle between Penrith and Melbourne, an 8 nil scoreline, which when you look at modern-day league, it's kind of like, God, the 60s want their score back. So just in terms of that, getting that balance right, um, how do you see that unfolding throughout the season? When it comes to scorelines and everything, I called the... I called the game between the Storm and the Panthers on the weekend and, you know, it was a real dour affair. It was, you know, defence wins matches as the old saying goes and the Storm did remarkably well. I mean, it wasn't a high-scoring game. It was only 8 nil in the end, but it was a real war of attrition, a real arm wrestle between those two teams. And, you know, yes, we have the excitement machines in the game and we'll probably see that tomorrow with Reese Walsh from the Brisbane Broncos. But when it comes to games that only result in an 8 nil scoreline, I, I get as much enjoyment out of those as I do the, the blowouts as well, where we see some of the, the fantastic tries. So, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a purist. I don't mind the arm wrestles and all that sort of thing. Having said that, when you've got Reese Walsh, when you've got James Tedesco, when you've got some of the other exciting players in the competition, you love seeing them with some room to move and for them to, to do what they do best. So... Um, looking at round two, we've got a, a couple of uh, good games to look forward to as well. Yeah, oh, that's the great thing about the NRL. You look at that draw every week, don't you? And you go, wow, that game, that game, that game, that game. I mean, almost physically impossible to watch them all. But you can actually at least always pick out three or four. Mark Levy is with us from the Continuous Call team. Obviously, I need to ask you about the Warriors, your thoughts on that. Look, if, if the game switched off after 14 minutes, we'd probably be sitting there going, they're the form team. Oh, definitely. And it's round one, and that's what I'd say to all of the the Kiwi fans over there in New Zealand. I mean, I, I thought they were in it, you know, up to their eyeballs, to use one from one of the great rugby league legends, Laurie Daly. He said uh, eyeballs once in commentary, <laughs> but the eyeballs, if you know what I mean. But, um, look, I, 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 thought, I thought the Sharks were good, don't get me wrong, but, you know, you, you look at that Warriors side, and I, I, I think Roger Tuovasa-Shek's got to go to fullback, if, if I'm honest, and, you know, given my read of the game and, and what they did... Um, last weekend. But, you know, you throw Roger Tuovasa-Shek, Daniel Matenis, Alesniak, Sean Johnson, who I thought had an unbelievable year last year. How he didn't get the Dally M is beyond me. But, um, you know, like, I think they're a really, really good side. Good pack of Ford, Kurt Capewell over there uh, now this year. So I, I think there's a reason for the Wawas to be excited about their team again this year off the back of what they did last year under Andrew Webster. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. Next! Roger at fullback, suggested also by Tony Kemp on the Rugby League Hour on Monday, says that Rog should move to fullback. I think if Andrew Webster could go back to Wednesday last week, I think Roger starts a fullback. After he reviews that game. See, he ran for 200 metres uh, detained. Roger runs for 300. Mark Levy says the same thing. Is it that obvious, Lachlan? Um, uh, it's a, it's strange. If they lose this week, it is. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. Like, I, um, my first thought was, and I'll always trust Tony Kipp in this kind of situation with his expertise over mine, particularly with the Warriors, because I don't watch them as closely as my Broncos. But uh, I, I, said, I said during pre-season, I thought, that he's your best option at fullback, even with Chance there. But I kind of understood why Chance has the job and why you want to put Roger in the centres. I just think he's a bit more of a game-breaking type player. Um, but in terms of linking up with the halves and the rest of the spine, I think part of Tua Picky that he doesn't have over Roger is one thing is when you've got the fullback who comes in as an extra playmaker is that it then creates more issues for the defence. You've got to worry about someone else when they can do multiple things. They can pass, they can run, they can step, they can bust the line maybe, depending on, on the kind of player they are. And so when you've got someone like Roger doing that when they're coming up through the back of the line, uh, sorry, the back of the offence, especially when they're linking up later in the tackle count, it then creates more issues. That probably takes the weight off someone like Sean Johnson or Luke Metcalf a lot more. 
Um, now, I'm, I think I'm paraphrasing pretty much what Tony Kemp said on Monday. Uh, so I would think that because he has that edge over Tane to a picking, nothing against Tane, he's, he's still a young guy finding his feet, but because Roger has that edge over him, which we saw bits of, I think, on um, Friday night, then the more reliable selection is to probably put Roger Bingo. there. Bingo. That, to me, is the thing. It comes down to experience. And yeah. right now, without Charns there, who is the number one, number one for the Warriors, you need the experience. I've, look, if they lose to Melbourne... And two picky is... I, I'd still give him a third week. A third? Big, well, because, I mean, it's not like they're playing well, the Tigers. Has, look, had chances out for how long? Well, it wasn't meant to be too long, but there's been rumours that he's got an issue with, I think, back nerves. Yeah, I something think. like that. So he look, could be out for longer. Watch the space, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be at all surprised if Roger does take his place. Next! One more question before we go to the break. St. George, impressive. Again, Kempi says this. Mark Levy says this. 28-4. Yes! Because everyone's picking them to be absolute rot this year that they're going to get the wooden spoon. It's the way the Titans... The Titans are the hot and cold team in the NRL. They're missing a few players, the Titans. But they define, to me, inconsistency, the Titans. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself with St. George just yet. They're away the Dolphins is the next game. But that's winnable. Yeah, very, that's absolutely very winnable. winnable. If they play the way they did last week. Yeah. They look... They're, they're a bit like the Roosters where they looked a lot fitter than the team that they were playing. Um... The Flanagan factor? I mean, yeah. Andrew Webster did this to the well, Warriors last year. For co- coaches, and I, yeah, you're right, and I think Todd Payton did it a bit with the Cowboys in his second year when he was there, that when you've got, play, at least the way that Todd Payton talked about how important preseason is to him with training and whatnot, with these coaches who win premierships, one of the most paramount things that I think they'd have an edge over other teams is fitness of their players. making Because as we saw with the Warriors last year, that you can just be, you can, you can have that edge and more prep in terms of your match conditioning that it makes everything else easier. Mega makes the back end 20 yeah, minutes. You exactly. start to own that, like, don't like, you? It's like me playing when I play um, social football. So when it gets down to the sort of the last part of the game, I'm just, I'm tired. Uh, it's a social game. I don't really care, but I like to play kind of hard. But I could just get tired. Your first touch is off. You can't run. You don't have the same sort of dribbling ability. And you ability. remember last year the Warriors were coming up through the middle, weren't they, in the last yeah. 20 minutes? They, they were actually owning teams. Whereas previous to that, the thing with the Warriors is you knew they were dropping off yeah. in the last 20 so, minutes. So that's the thing with the Dragons that was was pretty obvious. The one thing as well is that, you know, everyone acts like an oracle before the season and they've got their crystal ball and no one ever really predicts anything out of the ordinary in terms of who's going to make their aid and who's going to be bad. It's always very much based yeah. off the previous season yeah, unless someone's made big signs. Well, I mean, well, how and else can year, you go on, mate? I, I know. And every year there's two to three new teams in the finals, yeah. okay? Every year there's about two or three new teams I'd in the preliminary George finals. I'd love to kick me and everyone else in the rugby league balls and just to say, It'll, guess what? We are now the new Warriors. Yeah. We are now the, the North Queensland Cowboys the year before uh, that. I'll say this, though. I think it'll be a bit like the Dolphins last year. I think they'll fall off after 10 or 15 games. Right. They just don't have the talent. The Black Caps. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Now they've got that out of my system. How is our team going to be looking this time next year? Who's going to be the captain? Who's going to be the coach? Is Tim Southey still going to be there? Is Gary Stead still going to be there? Who's going to be leading the bowling attack? Craig Cumming, former Black Cap. Coach of the Sparks, he's our expert on all things domestic cricket. He joined us today to discuss. A couple of days to let it process, to let it think in, mate. Are you a bit of twisted? Are you warped and demented after a <laughs> test series that we should have won? We should have won that series, Craig. Well, yeah, well, we should. It's hard to say that, Marty, when you lose 2 0. Um, but if you go through it blow by blow, I mean, our challenges, we always look with it with our roast into glasses from a New Zealand point of view, but. Australia will look at it and go, we richly deserve to win 2-0 and, you know, New Zealand might have had opportunities, but we stood up at the bigger times and our players stood up and played match-winning performances and the difference between Australia and New Zealand was they did, we didn't. Um, but we do look back and go, right, there were opportunities for us to be better than we were, Marty, and, and it does hurt. I think it still hurts two days on because we just don't do it. Um, and we can't even say we don't do it very often because, you know, we don't do it and um, you know, we, we desperately want to because, you know, that is the gauge of whether you're a very good team or an excellent team is whether you beat the best. And um, as I say, it's like trying to beat the All Blacks. Um, you know, you're not the best in the team. You can win the World Cup, but, you know, everyone jumps on. If you beat the All Blacks, you know you're going pretty well. And, you know, we got to beat Australia. Um, we had them at home this time. Our conditions um, meant to be our backyard. Um, and somehow their team's better balanced. They play better and they seem to be smarter. Look, I, I liken it to Foley um, being told by the referee to kick the ball out, kick the ball out, kick the ball out. He didn't kick the ball out, and in the end, we won that game, and they're going to be sitting there regretting it forever, going, all we had to do was kick the bloody ball out, you know? And so, look, there are many moments during uh, both test matches where we had that opportunity and we just couldn't close it. So, 
We think now, how does the future look for New Zealand cricket? Because we could dwell on this forever, but a couple of real positives to come out. I mean, obviously those bowlers, Sears and O'Rourke are the future. Matt Henry's still got a few years left in him, but this black cap side in a year from now, how different might it look? Yeah, and, and I think that's our challenge is that we don't know. Um, you know, you go through this great period that we had, you know, in the in the late, you know, eight teens, um, you know, and I heard the other day, I mean, the reason we were so successful was Bolt, Southey and Wagner were in every test. I mean, I think they nearly got, you know, a thousand tests, with them, well, close to it, heaps between them um, when it came to, to the way they performed. But they played every test, Marty. And even Colin Grondholm was part of that. Um, so we actually knew what our side was going to look like. And we were able to have confidence in the way they were going to play because we knew that. Whereas at the moment, you know, Jamison's obviously just, we can't keep him on the park. Um, the poor beggar, you know, with stress fractures in the back. God knows when he'll be back and how much he can play. O'Rourke's young um, when it comes to bowling age. Um, you know, he doesn't have the miles in the tank, so... You know, can he actually get through a two or three test match series? Unsure. And even Spent and Sears, who was outstanding. I mean, he was going to play for Wellington, Marty. Um, his first first class game in God knows how long. And he was going to be on bowling loads because he's young in terms of bowling again. So I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. We know that Matt Henry's going to be there. Uh, we know that Rutsch and Revenge is going to be there. Hopefully Kane Williamson hangs around for a bit longer. But um, that's the problem. We, we're unsure of probably what it looks like in the next 18 months. So it's, it's hard to guess. Um, what it's going to look like. Also, we're going to go to the subcontinent for our next series. And tell me what your bowling attack is going to be in the subcontinent because we don't want to pick a spinner. You know, um, we've got you know East Sodi, we've got AJS Patel, we've got Phillips, we've got Satna. But but I mean, who's our best spinner? And Michael Bracewell comes back into the mix. But we're unsure, and and I still don't think we ever get our head around the balance of our side. And at the moment, we're still struggling with that. Greg Cumming is with us, former Black Cab. He coaches the Sparks Otago. A lot of calls, and look, and, 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 and these are just knee-jerk reactions. Uh, look, it's Gary Stead. It's his fault. I mean, you know, I just don't even understand this. Gary Stead has been, you know, the, probably the most successful Black Caps coach ever. He's actually uh, dialed back, you know, his involvement with the team, so he's not actually covering all three formats. We know that. To just all of a sudden start, oh, it's Stead. It's Stead's got to go. Southie's got to go. Look, you've got to find able-bodied replacements for these people, and I don't know how easy that is. And I'm not even sure that either when both guys want to go, you know, they will go probably when they're, they're good and ready. Or or is, is, is that argument valid that, hey, I mean, this is professional sport. You know, you lost this series. We haven't performed that well. I mean, okay, we beat South Africa. But, but of late, is it time? These guys have to move on at some stage. And it has to be, maybe it's now. Yeah, I mean, you know, I live in a glass house now when it comes to this, so it's it's hard to probably make a balanced comment. But um, but one thing that I'm sure they'll be sitting back and Gary Stead will be sitting back and, and they are accountable to is the selection of the side. Now, that's one thing that you can't get around and they do need to put their hand up. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if we take a couple more wickets and you end up winning that second test, then, you know, everyone's a hero. But And, and you can say, oh, they're brilliantly prepared and they learned their lessons. But the one thing that they do need to do, um, I mean, they prepare well, they train hard, they're organised and very well done and they manage, you know, big workloads, which is fine. They just need to be accountable to that selection um, of, of their team. And, and that's the number one thing that when it comes to what they'll be reflecting on and what they should be held accountable to is the side they sleep Because, Marty, we... We played Australia now. Australia, uh, uh, there are many different times during a year, and we know with 2020 and one-day cricket, we don't know who our best 11 is because players are in and out. Test cricket, as Australia have shown, you need to be able to pick your best team to be able to perform. That is a performance. Playing Australia at home is the one time that we go out and we say, this is strictly around performance. We want to perform against them. And if we don't, we need to look at ourselves because there are so many other areas of the game that... You know, there is probably, you know, we are looking at development and there are opportunities. But I also go back to even that last test. You know, you've got Tim Southey, who's bowling um, probably, you know, he's near the end. We know that. A lot of discussion. He's been wonderful servant and a performer for our game. Matt Henry, absolutely world class. But then we're asking, you know, someone like even Cougar Line, who's playing his second and third test, to do something for the first time against Australia. Even O'Rourke, we're asking him to do something for the first time against Australia. Then we bring in Sears, who I think exceeded expectations, doing something for the first time against Australia. And then we go and look at Glenn Phillips, who took five wickets in Wellington. But yet again, we're asking a guy to do something that he hasn't done before for the first time against Australia. So 
Maybe. I mean, why was Neil Wagner playing against South Africa? So when it comes to picking our team, Marty, why is he in the team to play South Africa and then he's not in the team and we had another injury? So why wasn't Ben Sears? Or why wasn't Kugelheim? Why weren't they playing South Africa? Why wasn't Glenn Phillips the number one spinner when we played South Africa as opposed to Mitchell Satner? So if you look at the consistency through that period, there is none. And that's the bit I think that needs to be you know, challenged and I think they'll need to reflect on and they need to look at what they were doing because playing Australia... They turned up with Cummins, Stark, Hazelwood. They've got Lyon. They were doing everything, not for the first time. Um, you know, they, even Steve Smith opening did it in the series before. We were just doing a whole lot of things, Marty, for the first time against the team we wanted to beat. The Tight Five. Five separate sporting topics. Roughly a minute or so on each. And when the bell rings, yes, I know, we go on to the... Yeah, I've already said we go on to the next one. Munster and Big Nelson missing. How does that swing the balance towards the Warriors on Saturday night, Lachlan? Champions League, Champions League, Champions League. The six teams in so far, two to go tomorrow. Did anything change today? Arsenal get through. Does that, does that, well, how does that affect who you think is going to win the Premier League title? Today in 1974, we celebrate what? The very first time we ever beat Australia in a cricket test. I can't remember anything about it. I was 10 years old. I can't remember a bloody thing about it, to be perfectly honest. Um, the Saudis, Saudi Arabia, this is, they're, you know, the prince with the $500 billion pocket change fund, have offered $3.2 billion of it. And this is the crazy thing, isn't it? So he's got 500 to spend. He's only offering you th- three bucks out of 500. He wants to now take over professional tennis and buy the whole of the ATP tour and of both men's and women's tours. World Rugby are going to vote on whether they are going to vote on whether they are going to talk about this 20-minute red card rule. Uh, as well as that... No, oh, no, let's just do those. That's enough. That's five good topics to talk about. Let's kick it with Munster and Nelson missing. Look, I'm not a betting man, Lachlan, but I'd say that this swings it entirely into the Warriors' favour. I think that the Warriors have got a hell of a chance now with Cameron, Cameron Munster out. I know he was missing in the first round, but Nelson normally comes off the bench these days, doesn't he? But he is an absolute wrecker. Mm. These two guys have been responsible single-handedly for burying the Warriors year after year after year. Surely it's a confidence boost for the Warriors knowing that I don't want anyone to be injured ever, but I'm, I'm kind of happy that those two guys aren't playing, if I can say that. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, it's two blokes. Um, and I'm just double-checking the team sheet from last week. So the Storm beat the Panthers 8-0. They mm-hmm. didn't have Cam Munster. They also didn't have Nelson Asafa Solomona. He's battling a hamstring problem. They didn't have him yeah, last week. Yeah, but we're week. not the pen with Panthers, mate. Yeah, you're not as good. That's no, my not. point. No, we're not. No. So, sure, you can sit there and say they, they're missing two of their best players. Yeah, okay, fine, you know. They're down on troops. That should help the Warriors out. The Warriors have their own injury troubles, by the way. Not from last week to this week, I don't think. But a couple of guys out near Cora, one of them were out near Cora. But for goodness sake, like, it's still going to be a massive, tall task. Mate, yeah, sure, it's a confidence. Like, actually, just quickly, I hate this. I hate it when teams do this. Mainly the fans do it. Fair enough. I mean, I do it to a degree sometimes. But I really hate it when you're looking at another team and you're getting pleasure out of someone being injured. No, I'm not getting you pleasure out. No, I'm no, not getting it. No, but, no from the, but you shouldn't be worried in any way, mainly as a team, but to a degree as a fan, of what the other team is doing or fielding when you're coming off a loss. Sort yourselves out before you care about another team. Yeah. But also, no, I'll just say quickly, it. We're favourites. Just, just say it. No, stop it. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to buy into this ridiculous <laughs> Warriors fandom that's going on. Now, I'm a big fan of Andrew Webster. I hope the Warriors do well. I genuinely do. But don't you dare sit there and tell me that they are the favourites or should be given a real good right, chance. Okay. We're the gonna storm. Have, I tell you what, the I can feel. I can feel a game. of more chance of happening coming on. I can feel a game coming on. They are a far better team. Come on. I hope Saudi Arabia buy tennis. So after they bought tennis, they've got F1, they've got heavyweight boxing, they've got UFC, uh, they've got golf, they're getting football. Indian billionaires own a cricket and have destroyed that game or are fast destroying it where test cricket is now just a, a, something us old people like. I hope the Saudis get tennis as long as it doesn't cock with the Grand Slam tournaments because outside of the Grand Slams, it's like golf. If Ryan Fox wasn't playing golf, or the New Zealand, you know, I wouldn't really, I don't care about the rest of the golf tournaments. The only thing I care about are the majors. As far as tennis goes, what other tennis do you watch apart from the majors, Lachlan? 
Oh, I, I don't. No <laughs> I one don't. does, mate. No one is interested in it. Not even Liam Le- Wells. No, no sure. one, ca- unless, of course, you're an absolute tennis aficionado like our old man, mate, Matty Brown. No one cares about those tournaments, right? Mm. So buy it, Saudi Arabia. Buy it and turn it into a... Just a whole lot of tiebreakers would be brilliant, Harry. The, your generation is going to look back, mate, in 30 years and ask people like me when I'm in the old folks' home banging the, the teacup against the thing, asking for nursing. You're going to be going... Why didn't you stop all this happening? Why didn't you rage against the machine? Why didn't you stop sport being destroyed? Sport was better when you were my... You know, I was your age back... You know what mm. I'm talking about. Mm. It's sad, mate. Well, But yeah, eventually but... what's going to happen is this crown prince is going to have Novak playing Rafa on his front lawn. He's going to have Messi versus Ronaldo in the back paddock, isn't he? And he's going to... That's, that's what he's going to get. He's going to own the world of sport. You're assuming that these athletes have no brains for themselves. No, there's not that they don't have brains, mate. They're just going to get tempted by the cash just, he's just, offering. Just, just quickly, a c- couple of things. Uh, so Formula One isn't owned by the Middle East, by the way. It's owned by a place called Liberty Media, which is American, and yeah, their CEO is Italian. what have they done, though? They've now got a Saudi GP and no, no, Azerbaijani no, no. There's GP. A huge, They've got there's all these a huge GPs, financial, which are just uh, financial like influence. And there's, boring um, ass. Someone, someone's being... It's a person or, a, or an organisation that are being investigated because apparently they tampered with the outcome of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix oh, really? last year or something. Really? But just quickly... Look, no, I, I'd love to see it because I don't care and it's inevitable in so many sports as it is. Um, but it's funny how people sit there and say that it's going to ruin sport because there's a generation that is starting out now that this is going to become the norm That's for. the norm. That's and the as norm. far as they know, in 30, 40, 50 years, well, what was it like before this? This well, just exactly, feels okay, normal. Okay, and, 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 and I have to be an old man yelling at the moon here, but, you know... I lament the loss of the FA Cup, which was one of the world's greatest sporting trophies. It had real romance to it. It had it a beautiful... OK, I lament... Still kind of does. I lament the fact that Test cricket is now just an afterthought on the international calendar. All of these things. And, and I'm glad that I lived through the time when these things were important. <laughs> world Rugby. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> Look, I keep playing that Mark Robinson quote. It's, there is, you don't even have to argue this as an argument. All you've got to do is play that quote of a guy that sits around a table hoping that the the best brains can get together and have the right conversations well, about talking about the topics let, that are important to talk about before we actually get together and have the right conversations. Yeah, let me let me read out. This is from the article that I've seen on Stuff. Uh, Sansar Chief Executive Brendan Morris attended the recent World Rugby Shape of the Game. Shape of the Game. The Forum in London. And he's told Why Stuff... Why don't they just call it Hand on the Johnson? Yeah. Um, and they told Stuff that... The, he told Stuff the proposal had been recommended for a vote at a World Rugby Council meeting in May, the 20-minute red card. So it's been recommended for a vote in a meeting in May. If successful, this vote, the council vote needs to be 75% uh, majority, by the way, that vote. The proposal would be advanced to a global trial, which yeah, is the first go. step into it becoming a law. So it doesn't even become a no, law. No, it doesn't become a law, no, no, no. It's all these just barriers that they're putting up no, themselves. No, no this, is what, uh, this is what those who are on the gravy train do. Yeah. You know... Gets because, them more money. That's it. They get another first-class airfare over there, another five-star hotel. Invoice this, invoice that. Invoice that. They don't pay for any... This, and this is why rugby is where it's at. <laughs> do we need to talk about two of the Chiefs Manawa players not doing a haka or... T- I mean, I can't even believe that this is a story. Yeah. How is this a sports story? I don't know. Two two players refuse to take part. Dominating in their on the after. head on the you know the well, you know mainstream what, you know, you media know why? sites because of one person who did it, Ruby Tui. I'm R- also curious. Me Tui. Everything that Ruby Tui does is me, me, me. It's all about Ruby, isn't it? I, look, I just I'm so over the story now. I'm so bored with the story now. As I said yesterday, I want you to triple down this week. Yeah, I want you yeah. to accuse. Every National Party voter of being a Ku Klux Klan member. I want you to go harder than you've gone before. Because every time you do this, you're killing your own game. And maybe in 10 years' time when you sit there and no one's sponsoring or interested in investing anymore, you might actually look back at your own selfish antics. Yeah. It always comes back to one thing to me. The name on the front of the shirt is more important than the one on the back. None of you players own these brands. They were there a long time before you started playing and will be there after you. You know, and maybe at some stage you might stop and consider the damage you are actually doing. Yeah, just... Uh, the I fa- damage I- you're doing. The people you're turning off. When I saw the... Good um, people who could be watching When I game. saw the... Yeah, I mean, we said this a lot last week. It's you're, you're pushing your audience away. You're not actually opening up your arms and welcoming people to take part in it. You're pushing them away. You're, you're cornering yourself, yourselves into a corner. The thing that I found really interesting is when I saw the story, I thought, oh, okay, two players oppose the haka. That's interesting. Oh, well, that's okay. And then I saw one of them was Ruby Tilly. I thought... 
I, uh, this is just a guess, and maybe you could say this is defamatory. I don't know. This is just my, my gut instinct. I don't think Ruby Tui is the kind of person to shy away from taking part in something like that. Just my guess. And I thought, so why are you doing why this? Are you doing You're this? doing this, in my opinion, for attention. Yeah. Yeah. And you're getting it, and good for you. And why is that? Because no one's talked about you for yeah, about and, a year now. You know, and the, and, the, and, and the worst thing about it is, is the next generation of young women who need the people that you are spitting at to support them to play this game are going to suffer as a result of this. And Avon Lee, who has been the biggest supporter of that Hurricanes power side, the biggest advocate in that, and you've treated him like an absolute turd. So keep going, keep, as I say, triple it, quadruple it. Just lash the insults all over the place because you're winning every time you do it. Apart from the fact you're not. I can't even be bothered talking about it, but I have been talking about it. Uh, Champions League, Arsenal are through. So the six teams that are there... Man City, Arsenal, Barcelona, PSG, Real, Bayern. Does the winner come from those six? Uh, so the teams to play are Dortmund, PSV, Atletico and Inter. The only one of those four that probably could is Inter because they're just running away with Serie A. They'd call off the season now. Uh, but I'd say, the, I, I'd say the winner will be one of Real, Man City uh, or Inter. Those would be the three, I think. Bayern Munich potentially only because they've just got one competition to worry about now. They, they're not going to win Bundesliga. So they might just throw all the eggs in the Champions League basket. But I think Man City are going to win it. The Premier League. One of the Premier Leagues in the world. And no matter what sport you like, this is just the biggest. It, it is global. Every single country in the world seems to love the English Premier League. I think alongside the NFL, I think alongside the NRL, I think it's like the AFL. I mean, I love Major League Baseball, NBA. These are the top leagues in the world. They are brilliantly run. They attract hundreds of millions, not billions of fans. And this year in particular, is, it creates its own little legend alongside all the others that have occurred during the Premier League's 31 seasons. Never before has the title race been this close with three teams within such a hair's breadth of each other. We lined up a correspondent from Arsenal, Man City and Liverpool today. Went back to back to back. Who's going to win that league title with 10 games to go? Adrian, do you genuinely in your heart believe that Arsenal not only can but will win this title? <laughs> well, I do believe genuinely with my heart that they can. That Arsenal are good enough this time around. It's a year on. From from obviously leading the, the the race for the title, at that point, I don't think that many Arsenal supporters really believed that they were good enough to hold off Manchester City, even though they, you know, they pushed them very close. This time around, it feels a bit different. The team's more mature. Um, they've been strengthened, obviously, by Declan Rice, massive player for Arsenal. Kai Havertz as well has come good, and I just feel that. That if you look at the form over the last two or three months, Arsenal have have been the best team in the Premier League. It doesn't mean they're going to be champions because they're up against two monsters of a teams, aren't they? I mean, Liverpool, and Manchester City are just brilliant, but but Arsenal are good enough. Um, it's just can they can they outpoint these two these two giants? What does it take from here, just in terms of the mentality of the club? And I think I saw a little bit of it against Brentford. It is just win and win and keep getting three points at whatever cost, isn't it? Yeah, the mentality is is obviously to, to keep winning. It's to... I, I think what was big about the Brentford result was that Arsenal found another way to win. They had to dig deep. They had to sort of be patient, not panic. I was inside the stadium and, and, you know, there was a lot of nerves among the supporters, but the players didn't show nerves. And that, that's a really, really positive sign because you can't blow every team away, four, five, six nil. It's just, it's just impossible. But, but what Arsenal have winning eight games in a row this year is, is massive momentum. And I think three teams, only three teams in Premier League history have won more consecutive matches at the start of a season. And they have all gone on to win the league. So momentum really does does matter. Um, but the, I think this season boils down to, to what Arsenal do at the Etihad Stadium. I really do. I think if Arsenal can go there and, and get a win, that they would then potentially be in pole position to, to do it. But that is a big ask, especially given Arsenal's recent history away to Manchester City. Let us talk Man City now. Chances off. 
Sam, you got out of Anfield with a point. Everything's square. We go into the last 10 games of the season with just a hair separating three teams. And this is the first time, from what I gather, in the whole history of the Premier League that it has been this close with three teams still with 10 games to go. So the first question is, obviously, do you genuinely believe that you can, that you will win the title from here? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I'm just actually working on an article for The Athletic right now looking at their running and with those 10 games left. But when you factor in potential Champions League quarterfinals coming either side of games, semifinals coming either side of games, if they get to the FA Cup semifinal, everything needs to be moved around. You start to think, uh, even the games that look pretty winnable, like Luton at home, they'll be making loads of changes because of the Champions League game. They've got Wolves at home, but they'll be making changes because of the Champions League game. They've got Spurs away, obviously Arsenal at home at the end of the month. It is a it is a really difficult run. Um and now I've looked a bit more in depth at it, and I'm starting to think that, no, it might be a bit too tough for them this season because I don't think it's been the best city this season. They're still really good. That's why we're talking about them being in the title race and just one point behind. Um, but if they're going to click and do what they did last season, then it's going to have to come pretty soon. But that said, they only clicked and did what they did last season because they saw it out right in the middle of March, start of April. So there is time. Um, but yeah, that Arsenal game is going to have to come then because if it doesn't, it, it might be too late. Why is City not as imperious this year? Uh, look, to win a title, you don't win every game 5 0, we know that. But it has been for quite a long, feels like a long time anyway now that City are getting these points, but they're doing that without really overextending or playing to the, to the full noise that we know Man City can. Are you thinking that there is going to be this 9, 10, 12, 14 match winning streak coming again because that's what has won the title in the last few years. I'm not sure, um, but I think the reason why they've not been at their, their very best and not looked like City is because they used to control in games. And obviously, Anfield yesterday, look, they've gone to Anfield in the past even when they've been very good and, and they've been blown away or they went there last season and they played pretty well, but they lost and all this kind of thing. So that can happen at Anfield. But look, this season... They've lost some of the players who take the extra touches and keep the game a bit safer and stop the counter-attacks against them. Like Gundogan going was a, a big loss for that. Mares too. But Grealish has been missing a lot of the season, either through injury or suspension, or, to be fair, he's just not been playing well. And if you look at how Julian Alvarez played yesterday at Anfield, it's a perfect example because he's always trying to go forward, but he's not protecting the ball enough. He's losing the ball so much. If you lose a ball in a game like that, the other team go down the other end and they have counter-attacks and it's dangerous. And then... If you're not so good on the second balls, and I've got a theory, I've got nothing really to back it up, but I don't feel like City are as strong on the second balls this season. So basically, I feel like... So if you look at the Chelsea game, for example, when they drew one all at the Etihad, and they should have still won that if Haaland had taken his chances, but Chelsea really rattled them. And if, if you look at the players ahead of Rodri, it was Doku, Foden, De Bruyne, Alvarez and Haaland. So five top-class players, but none of them there are slowing that game down. They're all going forward. And if you're all pushing forward all the time, if you're all attacking all the time, you're either going to blitz them with goals, which Haaland should have done, or you're going to give up loads of chances to counter-attack. And also, you've got players there who are less likely to put a tackle in and win the ball back. So they've had, they've had games that have been much less under control than recently. And for me, that's the difference this season. That's why they're still good, because they've got quality players. But they're not the best, because the best city is the city that can control games with players like Gundogan and Bernardo Silva. Sam Lee from The Athletic out of Manchester. Thank you very much for that. That's fascinating. I love hearing that kind of insight because I, I, I don't watch enough Man City to realise that. But yeah, leaving Liverpool to lucky last. Gareth Roberts, he started the Anfield rap, uh, now the Late Challenge podcast. What are the Scousers' chances? Gareth, so we've talked Arsenal, we've talked Man City. It's a hell of a title race for everyone that's not a fan of these three clubs because, you know, it's just nervous stress and tension for you blokes. Who's going to take the title out from here with 10 to go? Well, it, I mean, as a, as a commentator once said, and not in our favour, it, it, it's all up for grabs now. And it, it, it literally is, isn't it? I mean, you know, we're looking at it as Liverpool fans and we're saying, well, I'm arguing to my mates. It's in our hands. And they're saying, well, it's not in our hands, is it? Because, you know, Arsenal have got the same points as us. They've got a better goal difference. They scored more. They conceded less. All of that. And I'm like, yeah, but they've got to go to the Etihad. And I just don't see them personally going there and winning. And if you don't go there and win, and we just keep winning, then it is in our hands in that respect. That's how I'm looking at it. So I think if we win all 10, we've won the league. That's how I'm, I'm processing it currently. And I think, 
you know, there's some people are throwing some spanners into that argument, but I think, you know, my immediate friends who we go the match with, that that's our basis at the moment. We're like, there's 10 games. If we win all 10, we've won the title. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. Brendan Telfer, the doyen, 50 years of experience in the industry. So many topics to cover with Telf today. He joins us every Wednesday, the Brendan Telfer experience, the BTE. Cricket, and, and I know that you want to talk about why the Australian teams are more competitive. You want to talk about, John, uh, sorry, Daryl Mitchell's comments afterwards. And, you know, you've got, you think about it and you think we're celebrating it 50 years later. When we, you haven't won at home since 93, you haven't beaten them since 2011. I just wonder whether or not this particular group of players, it's impressed upon them. You become immortal in this sport, in this country, if you've achieved a test victory over Australia. So, yeah, that's why Daryl Mitchell's uh, comments were so goddamn confusing for a start. Uh, yeah, well, I think what happened is that Mitchell got himself into a bit of a stew because instead of using plain, simple, easily understandable English when asked to comment uh, on the Black Cat performance, um, he opted for some of this modern-day psycho babble um, where you talk, you don't talk about winning and losing, you talk about outcomes and processes and this sort of stuff, but not results. In fairness to him, and I mean, he's a quite a smart, decent sort yeah, of Yeah, I like him, I like him, I think he's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think what he was trying to say was that because we didn't beat Australia in these two tests, it doesn't make us a poor team or a bad team. Uh, all he had to do was to say that, and no one would have batted an eyelid. There you go. But all the, all the new speak uh, it, it came out, and it's been around for a while now. I, I, a lot of coaches love this stuff because they claim it takes the pressure off players if you don't use words like winning and losing and um, I, can still, uh, I can still vividly remember where i first encountered this it was in way back believe it or not 1995 at the world netball championships in birmingham and uh, in a big upset south africa with a player Irene by the name Van of Irene yes, Van Dyke, right. uh, knocked off the black, uh, uh, the, the silver ferns in the, one of their pool matches, and it meant that New Zealand then had to play Australia in the semi finals to get into the final. And so I was interviewing Lee Gibbs, the coach of the New Zealand team, and as I said to her, you know, trying to be as nice as I can about it, Martin, I said to her, Lee, if you can't beat South Africa, how are you on earth are you going to beat Australia tomorrow? And this is where she then went into this sort of discussion of words that I hadn't heard of before. And she said, well, um, it's not about results. It's all about getting your processes right. If we get the processes right, the outcome, <laughs> the outcome, the outcome will take, outcome care, will of take it. care of itself. <laughs> oh, no. And I, and I stood there on the street in Birmingham outside this hotel where they were staying, and I was just dumbfounded. I didn't know what this woman was talking about. I'd never heard of this gobbledygook before. Um, and But it's become quite common. And I think um, Daryl Mitchell, bringing it right up to yesterday, the day before, trying to project himself as a cool, hip sort of kind of with it guy, decided to use this sort of stuff and talked about the fact that uh, outcomes aren't going to define who we are as a team. Well, Yes, it's they not are. Surprising. Yeah, they are. Um, it's not surprising that guys from a slightly older school, Coney and Smith, Jeremy Coney and Ian Smith, um, saw red when they heard this, this sort of talk coming from a, a black cap. Uh, but I, I don't think Mitchell meant it to sound that I way. I agree with I think you. He's learned a lesson. He's learned a lesson. Okay, so the, Mal the, the Malaysia is going to rescue the Commonwealth Games, are they, Brendan? <laughs> the Commonwealth Games <laughs> Federation, I can't believe this. They're handing them a hundred and something million dollars, right? What are they going to get for that money? Apart from in six months' time, the Malaysian government's going to go, well, we've well, done a feasibility study and we can't afford it because it's going to cost us $6 billion. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's two hundred, closer to $200 million it? they've got. Okay. It's, not a, it's not a lifeline. It's about a 10% deposit if you want to run the Commonwealth Games. I think the $200 million is basically the default money that um, Victoria, Victoria paid, had yeah. to yeah. fork up because they've, um, because they've pulled out of the Games. Um, a couple of things, however, about um, Malaysia. They were the first country to stage the Commonwealth Games back in 1998. I, I remember it well. Um, uh, you were the, so did you go? You were just at a radio sport. Did yeah, you go there? Yes, you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yes, did, you did. Yeah, I was at uh, That's right. Malaysia. You and Dave Shirley, um, rest in peace, were there. Yeah. You remember uh, Shirley uh, was there. That's yeah, right, weren't yeah. you? Yes. Yeah. And um, Alan McLaughlin did yes. my show back in New Zealand. That's right, yeah. And anyway, um, so um, they threw the kitchen sink at the Commonwealth Games. They were the first, 1998, were the first, from my memory serves me correctly, the first billion-dollar 
Commonwealth Games. They built this amazing new um, stadium. It was as good as any Olympic stadium I've been to. It held 70 or 80,000 people. And of course, athletics has got no standing in, in Malaysia. So there was these paltry crowds there most days. It was packed for the opening and closing ceremony. But they built new stadiums, new highways, athletes, villages. Probably, I think they put a new airport in. Infrastructure everywhere. So they used the Commonwealth Games and the, all the attendant publicity they got. And they got a lot of kudos for being the first Asian country uh, to stage the Games. And they did a very good job. So I think the Commonwealth Games Federation, in desperation, thought, I wonder whether we should just tap Malaysia on the shoulder and see if there's any way they could pick up uh, the Victoria Games. And we'll give them a couple of hundred million to sort of get them on their way. But they'll still need to pick up a tab of a billion dollars. Now, whether the Malaysian government at the moment uh, is quite so keen about the idea of spending a billion dollars to stage uh, the Commonwealth Games... I have my doubts, but um, um, they probably could stage these, the games with very short notice because they built all these facilities in 1998, and for the most part, I imagine they're still there. That's our podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to listen to the entire show, 1 to 4, Monday to Friday, download the Platform app, and via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to whatever shows over however many weeks at your leisure, at your listening pleasure. Platform Plus. First thing to do, though, is download the Platform app. Devlin. Unbelievable. Incredible. The Platform.